Hey, welcome everyone to day two of our June 2022 FreeBSD Developer Summit. Um, this morning, or, well, sorry, I'm going to use local time zone, but you'll have to adjust. Um, for the first part of today, we're going to start uh, with two different sessions with a break in between talking about planning for 14.0 release. Um, and so we have, usually what we do during these sessions is we have a hack and page um, that we kind of track different items and different categories and we'll screen share that in a second uh, the link for that um uh, i need to share it in zoom but we've shared it on irc so those of you on irc can find the link um it's and it's also on the wiki page so if you go to the wiki page with the schedule the link for hackmd is there um compared to uh previous years um, for a couple of times now for fort Tano, we've done this a little differently in that we have Instead of starting from scratch each time, um, we've kept the same document to track items, 14.0 um, particular items. Um, and it's actually back to GitHub. And so you can see snapshots of different versions of the page over time over on a, a repository I have in GitHub. Um, and so it already has some stuff on it. And part of what we'll do today is go through updating uh, the things that are already there. I did. Um, added in some passes back in January. I did some work on it yesterday, trying to go through and find things that were already done and kind of move them to the done pile um, or updating the status and some other things that perhaps weren't yet done. Um, <clears throat> and then aside from that, before we jump in, and I know some of y'all will already be editing the page and jumping ahead of me. Um, one thing to keep in mind, I guess, is kind of timeline. So normally when we, we, we started this last year, the thought was, well, think about things that you could kind of, you know, for our target is what can be done in like the next two years or so. Um, we don't have a firm date for 14.0. Um, looking at kind of the timeline for when we release 12 and we release 13 and kind of what that gap looks like. My guess is sometime in 2023, um, maybe possibly like, Based on the gap we had between 12 and 13, it would maybe be around October-ish, but we don't have a date set and I don't want to put words in um, Glenn's mouth or anyone else from RE. So just keep some, maybe I would try to operate in the assumption of what can you maybe get done by kind of mid 2023 or something like that, but with a date that's to be revised in the future because it's not set in stone anywhere. Uh, so, with that, I think we would like, and this, so this session is gonna be very interactive. Um, so feel free folks to say things um, in uh, IRC on the Dev Summit channel on FNet, which is also bridged to the FreeBSD Slack instance. Uh, we'll try to watch there. You can also comment on Zoom if you're in Zoom and we'll try to watch that. So the first step, the first list we actually have are things that are already done. Um, we only really need to talk about that, except that we can see it, so we can scroll. Oh yes, Android too. We can also, um, if folks are on Zoom, you can raise your hand and we can see you. And if you have something to say, we can maybe let you pop in and talk a bit about what you want to, about the items you want to talk about. So we'll try to be watching for that too. We can maybe do a quick uh, once over of the completed list and just see if there's anything that's particularly notable or that we're going to need to, if, if there's any sort of follow on work that's related to it that we need to make sure, um, or if there's documentation that we need to, to make sure is is lined up uh, for 14 or things like that perhaps. Huh, I'm looking through them. Um, of course, I've also just read over these, so I'm familiar with them. I think yeah. most of them are documented. Um, one that happened just really recently um, is Hans merged some work for uh, TLS receive offload on Nix on that works on the Mellanox Nix. I don't think we have to document anything in the KTLS man page for that, but that's maybe one I could look at. Um, I want you to leave a comment, Ed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of these I think are already kind of documented in the list. Um, and there's, so we also at the, I should ca categorize the kind of topics we're going to walk through before we start walking through them. So this first list of things that are completed. <clears throat> and this is not an exhaustive list. This, are, this is just things that were previously mentioned on this page that have been completed. People will work on things that land in Fortinet or whatever without mentioning it at SMA, it doesn't make it onto this page. So there are definitely things that are, have been merged into 14 that's more than this. But at least the things we've talked about in the past, these are ones that, are, that have been brought up and that are done. Um, the other kind of 
four things we're going to walk through, the four categories, um, have are things that we kind of, this is something that somebody already has, like a patch or something like that that exists. And is, maybe it needs work to kind of be in, put into a mergeable state, but it's not vaporware. It is something that actually exists somewhere in some form. Um, and could be and is and could be upstream kind of within the time frame we're talking about. So in this case, maybe by sometime around 2023-ish or so. Um, I was just looking to see if Glenn had said anything about my scheduling rants. So I, I, I could add anything yet. Um, so these are things that like exist in some form. They could be out of the tree. They could be privately in somebody's forked version of FreeBSD internally at a, at a, at a vendor. Um, but there's something that they think is a candidate for upstreaming and that we in a, a timeline that could make 14.0. Um, oh, so Manu has responded to me to say, release perhaps between July and October. So we'll stick with mid 2023 as kind of our time range for what, we, what, we, what we're aiming for here. Um, and for new features, like you may be a little earlier than that because you wanted to have time to get in. Um, the next category is called need. And need are things that um, someone has a, a need for that as part of some product they're going to ship. It's something that, that they don't yet have. It doesn't exist in a patch that they have, but they really need it. And what's going to eventually be 14.0 in terms of when they're shipping a product based on 14.0, they're going to need that feature um, and what they're doing. And then... Um, Wants are similar to needs, but they're not critical. Like they'd be nice to have, but again, it's something that doesn't exist, and it's a little more um, like a little more unicorns and rainbows, but still something that could be implemented in kind of the fortunate time frame. And then the fourth candidate that we'll go over um, are things to remove, which are list listed as axe candidates um, in reference to our wonderful Danish friends. So. Uh, We've had this session overall split into two halves with a break in the middle. For the first half, we're going to spend our time kind of on the have on the have and the needs. And then for the second half, we're going to spend time on the want and the axes. Um, so, oh, and if you want to talk about at the very bottom, we have a, a, a way to annotate as things perhaps get stale on this list. Um, and if something is actually completely stale, we can remove it as we discuss through them. Uh, but it looks like Two question marks means that like, this was added at a previous summit and we don't know what the status is now, if it's still true or not. Um, and two bangs means that um, we need a new person who's gonna be the responsible person to kind of drive whatever item this says to completion. So that's an important aspect I should have mentioned, which is for something to be on the list, it needs an owner, which is the person to bug about the current status or kind of bug about, is it going to happen or not? So I think that's kind of all the overview of what this table, what this page means. So I think we can start now, unless there's any more questions anybody has real quick on the have section. Um, and we can either, so you can edit the page, but be nice to each other and don't clobber each other. You can edit it directly if you use the HackMD link. Um, but we can also, if you make suggestions, we'll kind of feed them in to the page as we go. Uh, and I might ask about things to see if people have status if it's some, uh, as we kind of go through the list of things that are already there. So the first thing I'll start with is um, Beehive support for ARM64. I know this is something uh, that Andy has been working on, both for the foundation and also um, through uh, Cambridge. And he has a branch that has on GitHub that has this. Uh, and um, I know it exists. I know that it's will hopefully be upstream quite you know much sooner than 2023. Um, yeah, I think it's it's pretty soon. It um, it needs uh, it needs a rebase for a couple of um, uh, conflicts that have arisen and, and things. But I mean, I think it is. I think it is close. Okay. Um, the next one on the list, uh, Brooks kind of talked about this yesterday during his talk. So I don't know that we've been to spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, but it's, well, this one's Merge and Morello support. Uh, but I think the, the broader question that Brooks was asking about, does it make sense at some point to merge Cherry support upstream? And, and what does that look like in what form? Um, I don't know that we have more to say about this than what Brooks already said yesterday. Uh, we talked a bit more briefly in the spatial chat after his talk. Um, but I don't know that we think that this is, I don't know if 
if it'll make 2023 or not. But yeah. do you want to say anything more, Brooks? I, I am pretty skeptical that it would make sense to merge uh, for 2023. It is possible that um, things will start to align, that will start to want to merge reorganization changes um, of some sort or some of the sort of general macro support, but probably not like actual, probably no assembly is my, my thought. <laughs> yes. Or current cap. We, we hope to never merge current cap. Um, Okay, uh, so the next one I have is an old patch that I have, um, which is to expand the file node field and standard IO file structures to an int. Um, and that's been installed for many years. I have the patch. Um, the problem actually is that um, GNU lib, which is used by a lot of open source to kind of patch things that it thinks are misfeatures in libc and other standard libraries. It, it thinks it needs to override how one of the methods work. I think it has to do with f unputs or f ungets or, or something like that. And so it, it kind of messes with internals of standard IO. And I'm not sure if it's needed and I haven't figured out how to go verify if the thing that Gadoodle cares about is actually broken in our standard IO and needs to be fixed or if it was fixed. <clears throat> 15 years ago and the workaround is stale and we could patch GNU lib to no longer do it. Then once that's fixed, you still have to kind of apply the same patch to all the umpteen copies of GNU lib and various ports on the tree before we can finally move forward with the source side of the patch. And I just haven't done the first part of that. I don't know if anybody else has any interest in looking at that part, but that's kind of what, what is holding that up. I mean, I think at some point we're going to have to just say, yes, we're going to commit to this and there's going to be a lot of fallout and we'll have to deal with it. Like I don't, the, the the waiting for the the the, the GNU lib dependencies to show up in all of the downstream ports, I think, is is basically means it's never going to happen. Well, if we had the patch, we could have a way of um, like a users or something. Yeah, that you could automate pulling in the patch. But I yeah. would need to. But we got to figure out what the patch is, and yeah. it, hopefully, it's that our standard IO actually is already fine, and we could just have GNU lib understand that. I just haven't figured out how to build it and run the tests and actually understand what it, what it cares about. Yeah, I really this at... is about. I want to make file opaque, and it's, right. that's really what the GNU lib blocker is about. I don't want to make file no because I have to move it to a new field, and I don't want to expose that new field in the AVI. I want to make it opaque yeah. before we start shuffling things around. Yeah. Just checking IRC. Um, the next one uh, is an old one. Um, which is uh, we've, FreeBSD 13 even included uh, this kind of newer A80 cipher, um, cha cha 20 and poly 1305 that we use, or 1035, I sometimes get the numbers reversed, um, that we use for KTLS. It's also supported, it's a recommended cipher to support for IPsec um, and AE has a patch for it. I think his patch has a few other things in it, but probably someone should just grab his patch and ex extract the actual cha cha parts of it and upstream it. Um, because I think A had it as part of a larger patch set, and that, but it's so the patch linked from um, linked from here now is is quite short, um, so, so I, I, it may have already been. It's not been committed, but it may it may have already been trimmed, and maybe we yeah. should someone should just commit it probably. Maybe I'll look. I, mean, I can't today, but someone yeah. should do that. <laughs> um, is there any reason A E hasn't just committed it? I have no idea. Okay. Um, see, does this work? If I click on that, does it share? Yes. Okay. Uh, see, some of this patch is not quite correct. Like all the GMAC okay. bits are not, yeah, it needs, there's, it just needs to be some of the other bits, I think. I'll look at it. Okay. Um, next up, uh, this, I looked at this one yesterday. This is IPMI for ARM64. And there were, there, it's a series of like 15 patches and I think half of them have been committed. So I don't know if Alan is around because it looks like the final ones and actually enabling IPMI on, on ARM64 have not been merged. Oh, there's Alan. Let's see, can we make you able to speak? I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Um... It needed a bit more testing. We were seeing problems where it would work for a bit and then stop working. Uh, and we kind of just uh, ran out of time to work on it and haven't got back to it yet. 
uh, but it is the goal to get that uh, working so that uh, this is mostly so that you can use like IPMI tool from the running machine to interfa interact with the IPMI on the machine. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, make the dev IPMI. Uh, and it would be helpful to have testing with other hardware that happens to have that. I don't know how I mean, many other types there are. <laughs> we only have two example machines uh, to test with so far. You mean other ARM64 hardware that has IPMI? Yeah, because uh, there's a variety of different ways it could be attached. And uh, we yeah, can only even test the ones we have. There's like three, three ways four, it could be Yeah, before. and uh, ARM, uh, the, the machines I have use a mix of one that x86 uses and one that x86 doesn't. Yeah, is it, <laughs> Something you have, that's weird. You have an SM bias attachment and maybe FDT. Yeah, I think the other thing is that the SM BIOS is V3, not V2, and that makes it similar but different. And okay. yeah, uh, but we got it well enough that you can run like IPMI tool land print one and, and find out the IP address of the IPMI. I mean, it's like not that. a driver that's owned by default, although I think you add it to generic, but even in x86, it's just a module people have to opt into. Yeah, and um, uh, we basically made it, uh, it would be a module like that for... Uh, ARM64 as well, rather than in generic. So I would be inclined then to just merge it. Even if it's yeah. broken on some machines, it's better to have it working on. Yeah, least on the I, think, I think at the moment there's some merge conflicts and I just uh, haven't ah, okay. had time to go back and fix it. All right. Um, so the next on the list mm. is hardware accelerated um, hat digests in ZFS. We're basically using OCF um, for digests in ZFS. Uh, I've looked at this PR. I revised this at this point. Most of the changes actually in upstream pull requests against OpenZFS, which I haven't listed here. The PR is just correcting some assertions that were wrong in OCF itself, um, and I hope to get that landed pretty soon. Here, I sent him an updated patch last night to look awesome. at that one. Thank you. Uh, the next one is reviewing the synchronization we use for IMPCB, and I guess with a thought of maybe using the newer SMR stuff from Jeff in place of Epoch. Um, and the owner is Gleb, and I don't know if Gleb is around today, but we could ask him what the status is. Something wasn't just in progress. I think that stuff has been committed already. Oh, okay. Well, then that's even better. Um, Let me see if make I can a... find a link. Yeah. I... If you can just say committed, and maybe we can always fix it up offline to see what, like, move it up to the pile and put what the revision was. Presumably, it's going to be something on impcb.c where you would see this. If we can't find it now, I can um, yeah. circle back with Gleb this afternoon. I'm going to oh. talk with him. Outstanding. OK. <clears throat> All right. Excellent. We can move that up to the done list. Cool. Uh, let's see. Next, we have um, a GP support for some of the ARM chipsets, um, which exists, but it depends. But that Russell has done for Cambridge. I know about this. Um, but it depends on some other work that I think Manu is in charge of, which is DRAM for ARM64 in general. So I don't know if, uh, do we have an item for that one, the, the kind of GMR for ARM64? Is that somewhere on our list? It should be somewhere, if not. Yeah, we do have, a, have an item uh, a little bit down the list in the app section. Uh, it's a global DRM in base for AMD, AMD7, AMD64. Uh, I just moved it in in the app section because I just have just a little bit of stuff to do, and it's totally possible to do that. Um, before 14.0. Okay. So yeah, hopefully I'll make some progress at the end of the summer 
and yeah, we'll probably we'll have everything done by the end of summer. Okay. Um, I know. I think has. Has uh, Ruslan given you like a, a pull request or patch against your tree to pull in the Penfrost specific bits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a I have a sub tree for, for ARM and ARM64, and the Penfrost um, driver is in there. Okay, so you've already merged his bits, and this is just part of now the larger project. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. it's merging DRM Camod uh, in base and merging my sub tree in base too. So merging both of them and put them to, into base. Okay, I don't know how we want to annotate that. Maybe we can kind of move it to like a, it's pseudo completed and now part of the DRM. We can update it however. Once it all gets merged, we can move them both to the completed, I guess is a way to put it. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Um, and maybe we can move the DRM ones together, but we can do that later. Um, so camcorder, this is one that Warners has worked on. And I think I saw you update it this morning. Yeah, I did. Um, I've found some rather serious problems and I'm working through them um, that I had no idea was going on when I gave my last talk on this. So I'm expecting to resolve those um, sometime this summer, but I was pessimistic and I expect to be done, you know, first part of next year with this. So. Okay. <clears throat> for the, for the, also, more generally, for the things I'm working on, when I expect to put them into the tree, I, I added an annotation. If you know it's something I'm 80% done or whatever, I expect, and I have work scheduled on my timeline, then I, I put that in as well. If it's not quite to review state, so this is more than a need, a little less than a have. Um, I'm not, not sure where to put those, you know, it's, oh, it's mostly it, done. It's mostly done. And if I, if I can find the two weeks to work on it, it'll be in. And if I can't, it won't, but. I think yeah. if, if the code exists, it qualifies as a have, even if it have can be needs more work to get upstreamable. Like that's, okay. that's that, that fits the have. All right. Um, then this is a have. Need, yeah. Need and want is more vaporware. Like, like I want this, but I have, there is no, I have no code for it. That's kind of the need. Okay. okay. Um, so the nine PFS client, uh, which is a file system used in some hypervisors. Um, I don't think Steve, I haven't seen him around on IRC from Juniper. So I don't think he can say status about this. I don't think has anyone else worked with this of late. Do you know Alan offhand? Uh, I know he's been busy moving, so I don't think there's been progress lately. Are you aware of, of like the status of the work at all though? Have you have you looked at it before? I, I seem to think you might have. Um, a little bit. I know I had um, Steve Wills and I played with it a little bit and got it going a bit more, although I think it still had some problems. Okay. Uh, I think Steve might have made a port of it so that you could try it out by like package installing it, but I don't know if there's anything newer since then. And Steve has said, <clears throat> excuse me, they have fixes internally, and that was kind of the next step he wanted was mm. to get those published. And I don't know. Let me go look at the branch. I don't know if, he's, if they have pushed anything to it more recently. Uh, it looks like it hasn't been updated since March of 2020. Oh, they have a separate branch for Vertifest. Let me look at that. Uh, last, uh, last updated in 2021. So I think since the last time we talked, it hasn't changed. Okay, uh, well, let's keep going. Let's try to get through more halves here. We're about halfway through our first section. Um, D-trace for VMs, I don't think, uh, like, I'm not quite sure I can say his name correctly. It was on, on IRC either, I haven't seen him. Uh, WireGuard, I think, um, Ed and Kyle and I have been talking, and I think this will most likely land in the tree. We're actually aiming for maybe by the end of June or sometime in July, so. Actually, I can add that. Uh, next up is <clears throat> my 
RERT2 SDT probes, which is another Steve one. So I don't know if, if we have, if any, unless anyone else has heard anything about that one, I don't know if we have more status on that. I've not heard anything. Uh, sounds like it'd be really useful for debugging Beehive stuff uh, or virtualization in general. Like uh, the, I think his was looking at the, the client side uh, to figure yes. out why messages are getting lost or whatever. Yeah, I think they. I think particularly they only can use Beehive. They tend to use like their nine PFS clients against. Uh, I want to say VMware. Linux Linux KVM. Oh, Linux KVM. Okay, and so I think Steve ones will have to skip. Let me see. Okay. Um, then we have several from Manu. I'm, I'm, that you want, I don't know if you want to talk more about these. Um, looks like you have SDIO. Well, you might need to explain better what these mean, Manu, if you just want to talk. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the whole SDIO stuff is a big problem for FreeSD. Um, currently, the design where MC driver doesn't support SDIO, I have patch for that. Uh, but I also have a lot of other patch for SDIO, which allowed me to talk to some Wi-Fi chips. Um, and I still have problem, like I, I couldn't really upload the firmware uh, and talk to the chips correctly. So that's why I haven't committed everything that I have, because I'm not sure that I've done everything right right now. It's better because before I couldn't, um, but yeah. So maybe this one should be moved to need. I honestly I don't know when I will have time to work on this again. Um, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and for the GPU path through for Beehive, um, we still I think we still have some patch at Bake Off for. Um, for some other stuff, uh, I need to check uh, with Corvin uh, from back off. Uh, I know that we have some patch for EDK2 um, for uh, AMD GPU. Um, I don't remember exactly what's the status here. I know that Corvin submit them upstream and I think it was either Baker or uh, someone else who didn't like the patch. Uh, it was solo dedicated to do some PCI uh, listing, whatever. Uh, I, I don't really know. I, I need to check. We have some patch and we have full GPU path through for a lot of hardware, uh, almost any hardware. So I need to check what's need to be upstream uh, so other people can have GPU path through too. Okay, and we already talked about DRM. Um, so this one's one that I think is newer, um, I think, from Mitchell about, um, I just looked at the review, it's patches to permit uh, having a Mac security module that um, can impose restrictions on when you can use the kernel debugger. Or which commands in the debugger you can use. So uh, oh, you can have funny. a machine locked down so you can do things like list processes, but not read random memory. Oh, OK. So that you uh, somebody can debug an appliance, but not extract secret keys and so on from memory. Do you have a simple, I'm trying to look at this patch. I think it's I think there's work. like four or five separate patches. I didn't list them all. Oh, it is a stack. Yeah. OK. And he posted these a while ago. I don't know why I didn't see it. All right. I'm here, by the way. Do you want to talk about it anymore, Mitchell? Um, I mean, that's, Alan pretty much summarized it. That's the okay. purpose is let, let you use the debugger to some extent while preventing the, uh, preventing the things that's going to um, let you inspect secrets. OK. And while I have you here, if we skip down to there's an item, which is kernel address sanitizer for ARM64. Yeah. And 
Okay, and you're active. It looks like, did you add this today, I think? I didn't add it, but- I did, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will add it for you, outstanding. Yeah, that one's in progress um, and it's, yeah, I'm working with Mark a little bit on that. Okay. Um, these next two, ARM64, is this, uh, I'm assuming since it's colored the same in HackMD that Alan added these two. Yes. Um, are these, is this like performance counters, PNC yes. or some other? It's, uh, drivers for performance counters. So you can extract okay. more counters on ARM V8 machines. Okay. Uh, Ray was working on those, but uh, he lives in Kiev. So Tumas is uh, working on finishing those up and getting them merged. Okay. Um, all right. We'll keep going. So that brings us down to um, TaraFS, uh, yeah. which was, has Des and Tom. Yeah, so that's uh, the ability to basically mount a tar file as a file system and be able to read from it with uh, okay. seekable compression. Uh, so you can make a Z standard compressed tar archive where the metadata knows where each file begins in the tar so that it's more performant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and avoids uh, what people are doing now, which is like a GMU zip of a CD9660 of a, mm. with an MD config yeah. and like seven layers of craziness. Uh, do you plan, is this going to have loader support as well as um, kernel uh, support? We had not planned loader support. I, I'm not sure it's necessary. Yeah. But. <clears throat> Oh, so, does this uh, let you um, use the init ram fs variants um, that you might get from a loader as well? Uh, is is that the no. motivation for it, or is that uh, no? Thing? The motivation is more uh, mounting a package without actually installing it, kind of thing. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I see why you're not planning loader support. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. Um, you'll you'll see why I asked in a couple of uh, items. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. So one one interesting comment on this um, is we have a um, GSOC like student um, looking at Squash uh, FS as well, which seems like it would. It, it, I mean, Tar Tar has a very um, uh, useful use case that isn't covered by Squash FS, but um, but SquashFS would also serve some of these purposes. So that's something I guess that's interesting to, it, this may, may eliminate the need for, for that. Okay. Um, I think the next one on the list was from before. I don't know if Christoph is around to speak to it. Um, I think DCO is, uh, I don't know the, the expansion of this, but I think it's like a kernel path or an optimized path for the data plane for OpenVPN. Exactly. It's it's basically moving some of the OpenVPN functionality in the kernel. So you save yourself some trips into user space that you would have with TAP. Okay. Um, and is that something that would make use for, like, does OpenVPN, does OpenVPN use TLS? They use it for connection negotiation, but okay. not for the actual VPN tunnel itself. Hmm. But, um, does, but that's still encrypted. I wonder if it's, is it like an IPsec style encryption or something? It's, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a UDP tunnel that's encrypted with their own magical foo. Okay, I mean, if it's, but if it's like a standard, if it's like GCM or something, I guess- It is GCM, this, yes. Well, be, uh, with DCO, they support uh, GCM and ChaCha. Okay, well, okay, so that's pretty bog standard. So is your plan to use OCF in the kernel then to do the yes. actual- Okay, so what's this, let's see. Oh, you have a review, okay, all right. There is a review, uh, that patch has one or two more issues, uh, but I have patches for them. Uh, I expect this to land soon, uh, but I'm in no huge hurry because the user space support for it needs to land as well. This isn't actually useful without the patches in OpenVPN, uh, the user space code. Yeah. Uh, that's going that to come 
in their upcoming 2.6 release, uh, which I think is probably a few months out. Uh, I have patches already. Uh, I've sent them patches as well. Uh, I expect the FreeBSD support to land shortly after the Linux DCO support lands. Yep, that's a very similar story to kernel TLS and OpenSSL. <laughs> I, I know, I feel your pain. Okay, do you need reviewers for this at all? Uh, a couple of people have looked at it already, but more eyes, more better. Okay. All right, that sounds good. Um, then Warner, you have a trio here. Do um, you want to talk about these at all? Uh, it helps if I talk unmuted. Uh, the first one is um, basically uh, expanding Kboot uh, to work on ARM64 and AMD64. Kboot, for those of you that don't know, basically loads the kernel and does a kexec, um, which is the Linux boot environment. We have a need for that for reasons I can't really talk about just yet. Um, and so I have patches, I have it almost working on AMD 64. Once it's there, I'll switch to AR 64. Um, and so I expect to have that towards the end of Q3. Um, I have a number of uh, NVMe dynamic namespace support so that when thing, the namespaces arrive and leave, everything works. There's also a review um, that uh, changes, that is a subset of that, which I hope to fold in, which does, um, when name size sizes change, uh, disk resize will get called. Um, and then, um, and that should be early Q3, because I, I plan on working on that um, <clears throat> next week. Um, and then uh, I've been shepherding Linux compatibility for Indian.h and Byteswap.h, and there's a few stragglers um, in uh, ports that um, they do things. They detect both of them, um, but then they make unwise assumptions. So I need to untangle that. Um, you know they. They detect that they have the Linux one, but then since you're on BSD, they assume you have all the BSD parts, which is not quite right for any of the BSDs. So um, it's just unwinding that. I think there's four left. There were 10 when I started. Um, and so that should, uh, again, that's something I do as I have time. So late Q3, early Q4 is my guess for when that will be landing. Okay. Um, then the next one, I guess, is from Mark, which I've heard about, but I haven't looked at myself. Um, but it sounds like a lot of work, which is support for ZFS and MakeFS. And you have a review. So do you have a, do you expect this to land soon, Mark? Yeah. Um, I think there's one or two things that I might um, tweak before I do. I think Alan suggested that. Like when you specify data set parameters, right now I use a colon as a delimiter and, and that might not be such a good idea um, for, for various reasons. So I might change that, but by and large it's done. I haven't gotten much actual review on the on the code itself, which is fine, I guess, because it's kind of, um, I don't know, it's, it's a bit complicated. Um, and Alan pointed out a couple of issues with, with a few particular things like metaslide sizing in particular. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's mostly just, I think a question of fixing up a couple more things, maybe writing some more tests and then uh, um, just seeing if anyone's interested in reviewing it. If not, I'll, I'll probably just commit it. Um, and after that, I have patches to um, let one build ZFS based release images like VM images. So you can create uh, ZFS root VM images and cloud images and so on. Um, so what I would like to happen is for those images to start being built um, the same way we do for, for UFS-based images, and then we just mark them experimental for some time until uh, any issues with the MakeFS support get flushed out. Um, do we, like, as a larger goal, do we envision shipping ZFS route for, for example, some of the cloud images by default for 14.0 as like the default image? 
I don't know about default, but certainly I'd like them to be available, yes. Okay. So, so, so we do I mean, foresee having both going forward and not it's like switching from UFS to ZFS, but providing both variants? Uh, I mean, for 14.0, yeah, I, I think it would make more sense to provide both. I don't know if there's any okay. constraints that make that, you know, difficult for some reason, but um, maybe maybe in the longer longer term, we'd, we'd switch to providing ZFS only. But um, I mean, yeah, it's hard for me to say. Maybe there's there's a lot of valid use cases for, for using a UFS based image. I think there still is is value in in UFS based images for s small VMs and. So I think I, I would like us to do both. Um, I think that's, that's probably a broader question about how we, um, how we produce and uh, make visible um, cloud images. Uh, I mean, there's no, there's no fundamental reason we can't have lots of different varieties of, of cloud images. It's really just a question about discoverability and, and you know, what, what's, um, we don't want to overwhelm the user with like, like our, our our download page for you know um, bare metal installs, it's a bit of a bit confusing to, if you don't already know what you want to to figure out what you should install. Um, so again, I think that's that's a separate question we need to sort out. Yeah, because UFS is great for disposable VMs. You you bring it, you spin it up, you do yeah. something, and then you throw it away, and um, it's much lighter weight than uh, ZFS. Yeah, like the the Cirrus CI um, VM images that we were talking about yesterday. Um, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure that there's a lot of value. I'm not sure there's a lot of value in trying to switch those to to be um, uh, ZFS images. Um, yeah, and, unless there's a testing purpose to that, I would agree. Yeah. yeah. Or if you're really constrained on space. Yeah. Like I don't know if uh, yeah. if the 80 gigs, 40 gigs, or whatever you get with Cirrus CI is the most we can get, then the compression might be worth it. But other than that, yeah, I think UFS still makes sense. Okay, um, so the next, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if Rob is here, before, but Alan, you're also listed. Um, it looks like this is boot environments for jails. This is kind of like BE cuddle, but for jails instead. Yeah, so it allow you to swap uh, the which version of FreeBSD a jail is using back and forth with just restarting it like you would with BECTL for uh, the host operating system. Okay, uh, little containers. Yeah, uh, so it's a work in progress, but it's up on GitHub. And then when it was, once it's working well and, and people are happy with the use case, then we would uh, propose putting that in base. Okay, so then we have um, two items I saw where it just were added in the last few minutes um, by Satosan, which are ooh, serial console over USB 3 debug. That sounds pretty cool. Um, that sounds very really exciting. Expected in July of 2022. That's actually, that's outstanding. Um, and then I don't know if Santo san you want to say anything if you're on Zoom. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I have um, uh, some implementation that's, that can support the USB XCI debug. It, 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 this is. Uh, basically, uh, serial console over USB cable, and the uh, USB three supports uh, a special cable, and it's a basically a crossover cable, a type A to type A, and uh, you can find uh, this kind of uh, cable in the market. So you can buy, um, I think, uh, five dollars or ten dollars. So um, once the support is uh, merged into the uh, uh, kernel, you can um, access the uh, say um, a debugger in a kernel over the uh, USB cable, and uh, this supports the um, uh, connection over the USB hub. So it, it should be useful for the kernel de kernel developer um, who are using the uh, laptop or a small computer that does not have the serial console, CL port, a physical CL port. And the next item I added, I just added is the syslogd uh, rewrite uh, to support the 
TCP and the TLS. That's all I have now. Okay. Um, then I had added something about there's a there's a, there's a bit of a backlog of various Beehive patches. Um, I need to chew through. Uh, some of them are small fixes, but then the UPB votes have some much larger fixes um, that uh, add someone, probably me, but probably some other people need to spend some time reviewing and, and kind of shepherding these patches in. So then the last one I see on the list here um, is support for a 16 kilobyte page size on ARM64. I've seen various patches go into user space. I, I don't know how much of user space is fixed. I kind of had a sense that we'd fixed all the things in user space that, well, the base system user space that hard coded a page size. Um, but it looks like this review is the kernel support that hasn't landed yet. So I don't know if anyone, I hope. No, if, 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 if Andrew's not here, I can speak briefly about this. There's about a dozen different places. Oh, we Andrew's need to here. Change. And okay. I'll let Andrew talk. Uh, yeah, so there's a, um, I think there was a few UFS fixes that need to go in and I need to do uh, fix loader to quickly align um, align modules um, because they may, um, currently assumes a 4K alignment. Um, and most of the UF, most of the user space parts are fixed, I think. The main the main one is J Malloc. Um, hard codes, it's maximum page size, but I think it works if we just increase that. Uh, and there's just there's still a few more paid places where we hard code page size other than that, but um, they're mostly not too bad. Okay. Um, I'm curious, do, does it, an object like ELF object files for ARM64, are we still setting the alignment for segments to be 4K or do we need to like, or was that already something larger like 64K to begin with? Uh, I have a feeling it's something like too, too big, but um, so yeah. that'd be super page line. I'd have right, to yeah. Okay. All right, and then Brooks added one. I'm gonna add at the end. Um, uh, he says, it's not sure if it's have or complete. I think it's mostly a have. Um, oh yeah, I don't know how complete it is. Uh, for CherryBSD, we are cross-building our releases. We actually build the releases on Linux. Um, like we actually build them as part of our CI. Um, so we have, I think most of the patches have been upstream, but we might have a couple that are downstream. Um, yeah, I just, I just wasn't sure if Jess had managed to land everything. Yep. So I will put that. Um, uh, the big, the big unsolved problem is that our man pages have um, collisions on case insensitive file systems. Um, so we might want to consider just fixing that. That's kind of hard in some cases. Um, yeah. I think there's some kernel ones where we have the all uppercase and the lowercase versions for like bus setup interns and things like that. One's a macro and one's the implementation. Yes. Oh, one is a KOB method and one's a wrapper. That's a convenience wrapper that everybody actually uses because you shouldn't use the macro directly. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's work. Yeah, that's work. <laughs> and that only affects Mac OS by default, right? Because Linux's file systems are case sensitive. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's only a Mac problem and you can work around it. It's just, you have to remember to do it. Yeah, I have the thing where I have a separate volume on my Mac with a case sensitive file system. It's a bit clumsy. Um, okay, so we're actually at the end of the time for our first slot. Um, no, we didn't, we spent all our time on have, but that's, I think that's okay because have is a, is a the longer list that we have in the page currently. Um, so let's go ahead and take our break. We can continue discussion perhaps a bit over in the hallway chat or if folks need to run to the restroom or whatever. And when we come back, we'll try to work through our, our next section. So when we come back, I do think the first thing I want to talk about is, the, is if there's anything more to ask. So be thinking about that if there are things that um, we should be marking deprecated now or um, trying to remove, probably more like marking deprecated with the goal of acting in 15 at this point. But if there are other candidates for that, we, that's I'd like to talk our discussion with that because I'm a big fan of removing code as well as adding code. So I'll see you back here in about 25 minutes. <laughs>